Welcome, everybody. It's your host, Helen Hillix, for the series Sex and Spirituality, Passionate Intimacy Without Shame. And today I have the inimitable pleasure of having Caroline Muir, who is one of the absolute pioneers in this whole topic of sacred sex. She's known worldwide for being one of the pioneers in this area. And I'm just so honored to have you here today, Caroline, and I know the audience is going to get so much from your talk. So I wanted to make a quote or read a quote that Caroline wrote. My teachings are based on a foundation of 45 years of Hatha yoga, meditation practice, and living a healthy, vital life filled with love. And I, that just blew me away just to start off with. And I thought, if everybody could say that, their lives would be fulfilled. So that's, that's who Caroline Muir is. She, she is the author of two best-selling books, Tantra Goddess, A Memoir of Sexual Awakening, and Tantra, The Art of Conscious Loving. And she and Charles Muir, I believe, co-produced the DVD series, Secrets of Female Sexual Ecstasy. So Caroline's work has been instrumental in inspiring sacred sexual awareness worldwide, also known as Tantra. She's a celebrated yoga educator, best-selling author, as I mentioned, and co-leader of the very popular Tantra, the Art of Conscious Loving workshops. And she's now in private practice and does work with men, women, singularly, and couples. So... I, I could go on and on. She's known for groundbreaking work with G-Spots, healing and awakening massage, and educating both men and women about the full spectrum of their orgasmic capacity. Anyway, we could go on and on, but I think I should stop. So, that's, uh, but, but I do want to say that one of your um, focuses is that education at every level is the core of what advances human existence, period. And I love that because... Sex is such a vital part of our experience as human beings. And if we're not educated, we're not going to be evolving. And I forgot to, to mention why I'm doing this series, which I want to throw in now because I know it aligns with Caroline. And that is because our world, our culture is so skewed about sexuality and what it is and what it what it can be in a, in a lifetime and in, in a relationship and that we need education so desperately about how to have sexuality that overcomes the shame that we learned from religions or our parents or our own behavior or whatever our thoughts are, our judgments about our bodies, whatever it is. So that's why I'm passionate about this. I've been a therapist for 35 years and I've worked with so many couples and individuals who have shame about their sexuality. So that's why I'm doing this series. And when I heard about Caroline, I knew she had to be part of it. So welcome, Caroline. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, uh, I'm here with tears in my eyes and um, a lot of emotion going through me as I hear you speak. Wonderful. I love that. I love starting out an interview <laughs> crying because that's yes. the passion. That's yes. the passion. And that shows up so much in your work. <laughs> and, you know, people, if you haven't read her books, you know, you're missing out because they're a delight to read as well as incredibly educational. So let's start out with a very simple question of how do you define sex, Caroline? Wow, that's such a loaded question. I know, I know. There's, but a, there's a bottom line and a top line. In let's hear answer. both of them. And I often in our courses, Tantra, the Art of Conscious Loving, uh, would define sex for most people much of the time as the copulation of eunuchs. The copulation of eunuchs? Eunuchs. In other words, there's nothing going on except they're just doing something that they think they're supposed to do. Uh, maybe, maybe there's some arousal eventually. Maybe they make some love, even if they call it love making. But so often sex is just a, a penis and vagina until somebody is finished and that's it. And there's like no, nothing more to it than that. So I, I think that, that what, what brought me into this subject matter was a longing to know what is sex and 
how am I supposed to be doing it? And what is doing it right? And what is doing it wrong? And how, where can it go from just scratching an itch, fulfilling a need, a physical need? Because we, we all have a physical need from time to time or, or a lot, depending on who you are, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So that's also sex is getting a ne physical need met. But in its highest vibration, and which is what I finally learned and was, was blessed to get to practice for so many years, was that sex is an offering to God, the very creator that brought us into these bodies and gave us these genitals and these funny looking parts that we didn't quite understand from childhood. Mm -hmm. And um, that in the bedroom, we can make an offering to the divine through our bodies and our bodies are just instruments for loving. I love so, that. I, I just, I mean, from the sublime to the ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it is so true though, that most people have a very, very limited experience of and understanding of what sex really is. And I, you know, you explained it very well. And so let's take a step aside and ask, what do you think people want from sex and are they getting it? That's a good question. Well, certainly most people want their orgasm. That's the selfish need to go into sex is I want my orgasm. And um, it's easier for some to have that orgasm or those orgasms than for others. But there's this longing and this driving need to get to the finish line. And I think there's, and more so for women, and this may not be true for all men, but women have a deep longing for connection and intimacy. And m many women are having sex in order to get some intimacy and some connection. Uh, with their partner, because intimacy is not the a driving force usually for the masculine. And this is not all men, but women have this driving need for intimacy. That's why we choose to spend time with women a lot, because we could talk about anything instantly. During a simple manicure, we can discuss our deepest issues with the while getting our nails done. Well, <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's a, a skill we carry and a need and a longing we have, but it also is difficult in male-female relationships to get that intimacy need met much of the time, not all of the time. What I have found is that men want to connect. They have just been taught by our society to translate all that connection energy into their penis. Good comment. Uh, Good, it's true. And, and when the education is complete enough for men to own and women to realize that men have more than a penis down there. Now, biologically, that's what they call it. But in the tantric writings and teachings, the penis is called the lingam, which is a Sanskrit word meaning wand of light or wand of God. And when I heard that, I kind of went from, oh, all those penises just want the same thing, to, oh my God, all those wands of God want to connect with the goddess. <laughs> oh, that's what sex is about. I love so that. I, I started liking sex more when I could translate the all-American languaging into something more sacred. I love that. And that brings about, you know, another aspect of the questioning is, do you believe, I mean, I know you do, but can you talk about that, the integration of the spiritual into the sexual and how that shifts, you know, you just began saying it right there about yourself, which I love, you know, once you were able to define or conceptualize the penis as the wand of God, it changes everything. And so can you talk more about about that integration of the spiritual and how that revolutionizes your sexuality. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, it has so much meaning for me because as a kid, as a child growing up in my church with my family, I really did connect with God at church. 
Um, even if it was in passing little love notes to my grandpa next to me or a piece of candy and giggling, there was something about church that was very sacred and holy and I loved being there and I loved praying and I cried when I prayed. And I, so I had a deep early connection with God and God was a masculine force. No question. It wasn't until a later in my spiritual path on my yoga path and spiritual path that I came across a book called the feminine face of God. And that's when I went, Whoa, that God is also female. This is not just a masculine male female thing. This is an amorphous being that embodies the masculine and feminine. So then my prayers and my connections to God became also my prayers and connections to the feminine and to yourself outside, outside and inside me. <laughs> and that brought my sexuality into a, a, a place where I could hold that the union of masculine and feminine creative energy, which is certainly sex is a creative energy. It creates life in one form. Mm -hmm. uh, it creates great pleasure in a good form. So that creative life force energy of the masculine and feminine uh, in under the umbrella of God's love, that made sex something I was happy to have and do and perform more of the time. <laughs> I love that. And, you know, I, I'm sure you have found in your years of working with women and couples, but that it's such a shift in consciousness when, when the sacredness gets integrated that, that the women are able to say, you know, I'm not just surrendering to a dominant male force. I'm integrating the male and female with the oneness. I mean, is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And, and for women to, again, go beyond the, the shame or the shyness or the embarrassment and really become the active in sexuality. And when she is on top, she is the goddess incarnate. And I actually had to see other women being on top with a man, to see the ecstasy that they were, to, vis to see it visually, and not just my own if I was on top of my beloved, but to see a woman in ecstatic pleasure told me that there's no outfit she's ever going to buy that's more beautiful than how she looks when she's in her ecstatic pleasure with a partner. And it doesn't even have to be orgasmic. It's, I mean, the orgasm is this goal orientation, but orgasmic energy is always flowing. So we simply have to learn to play with it. And in playing with our bodies move more easily and we laugh more easily and we're not so hunkered down and serious about enough friction and enough speed to get to this orgasm, which usually happens easier for the male before the female. Um, but a luck, lucky women are hooked up and wired up in a complete way that they have those orgasms right along with the, the masculine and, um, those women like sex. I love what you're saying, though, about playing with the orgasmic energy and not having it just be about friction. I can't remember. I think it was Steven Snyder, the psychiatrist who wrote Love Worth Making, yeah. um, which is a, a, different, a different focus. But he says, you know, all of us are saying so many of the same things now. They weren't when you started saying it. But, but now a lot of people are, are saying similar things. And anyway, the, the, whole, the whole kind of funny way of talking about, you know, friction plus speed equals, you know, it's just not about that. But that's what we've been taught. And it's hard to overcome that. It really is. I mean, I, uh, Helen, perhaps for you as well, I came from a very traditional Midwestern 1950s background. And sex was what, you know, there were, there were line drawings and books up on the top shelves of our parents' closet that were somehow taught them about sex. And um, 
And yet the curiosity and the fascination with this energy that we were feeling as young girls and we were touching ourselves and it was feeling really good, but we weren't supposed to let anybody know. We were, have to be very private about these things. And then, you know, I got married really young. I was a virgin when I got married and I didn't know anything about anything. Zero education. So, you know, a week after marriage, we found Vaseline and finally he slipped on in with some Vaseline, but we didn't know why it wouldn't go in. Oh my God, it's <laughs> yeah, just right. crazy. It's just crazy. Well, I've been a long way. And when I first started teaching this with Charles, I was too embarrassed to say the words, the word penis or the word vagina or the word clitoris. I, I didn't speak for the first year because I couldn't get those words out of my mouth. Wow. I was so embarrassed to say them. So it took a lot of practice and a lot of listening and a lot of patience before I became verbal. And you talked about this a little earlier about how important it is to talk, to talk to your partner, you oh know? Yeah. To look at our genitals and to introduce them to each other and show the person where it feels good and why it doesn't if you do this or that and really kind of give a lesson because as we would say in our course, they don't come with an owner's manual like our cell phones do and our Kindles come with an owner's manual and our cars come with an owner's manual, but our genitals don't. So and concept, yeah? And our parents generally don't say a thing about it. Uh, you know, nowadays I, I have seen some parents who get books and go through them with their children and, you know, do some sort of education. But, uh, you know, probably they're not going through the art of conscious loving, you know, so they're probably learning some of the skill, but not really the whole picture. And that's that. I just keep, I want to keep coming back to that because I know that the inclusion of the spiritual is part of, how do you, how do you explain that, how important it is for that spiritual connection? Uh, I can explain it by uh, a suggestion to practice it. And here's how couples can so easily practice bringing spirituality into their sexuality. And this is what I learned with Charles. And because we both, I was his yoga student before I was ever his lover or his beloved or wife. And um, so we would do yoga together. Now we would meditate together and we'd sit across from each other and hold hands and meditate together. And, and many couples do go to church and take their kids and, but they don't, do they pray together? So I would suggest for any couple to, before you be, get sexual, sit on the bed together and pray. And maybe say your prayers out loud and maybe just say them silently, internally, and then open your eyes and look into each other's eyes and let those prayers speak through your eyes of the love that you have for one another. Because love is the vehicle to more love. <laughs> so open your eyes as you begin moving into physical intimacy or sexual intimacy and really look into one another and see and be seen because that's another missing piece in sex. The eyes get closed and hopefully he or she does what I like. So true. So true. Eyes get closed and you just hope for the best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the all American sex way. And it's what they show in all the porn videos that apparently are everywhere for people to watch. Um, yeah. I think the last video I saw was in the 1960s and they were like super eight videos or something like that, these big clunky things. And I just thought this is the silliest looking to look at one of those and then to get aroused and then to have sex was so, I, my body wouldn't keep up with what my brain was saying. Even if I did feel aroused, it didn't feel like a connection of love in any way. Um, and so often people use the porn video arousal to get in the mood. And I would say getting in the mood is to hold each other and kiss each other and look into each other's eyes and feel each other's bodies close 
and take some deep breaths and see if the mood doesn't naturally come around. And if not, you can, you've got a lot of loving experiences. Yeah. Put the parts together. It's like rubbing sticks together to start a campfire. Rub the parts together playfully and things begin to happen. What is your, you know, you're mentioning pornography a little bit and how do you, how do you see pornography impacting our society and the sexuality of? I think it's very, body? very harmful um, because it, it teaches, it teaches the men how women should look in a sexual situation. And it teaches them uh, that more friction is better. And um, most women will agree at some point, more friction is not better. And, um, but the guys think, well, that because I don't know, I think it's more men that watch porn, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the women no, do too. It's more men. I mean, women do, but it, it's definitely preponderance yeah. of men. I, I have a, just a, not a good feeling about the whole kids learning about sex from seeing stuff online and not learning from their parents that, that it's about making love and it's about loving that person. Even if you only see that person one time, love them with all your heart, love them with your body and wish them well in their life. Even if that's the only time you're with them. So even hooking up one time can have meaning and heart and consciousness for singles. And, you know, I like that so much because that's definitely not the experience that I had when I was back in the sexual revolution in the 60s and 70s and, uh, you know, hooking up with lots of people, ending up feeling a lot of shame because it wasn't as you describe it. And, the, and there's no reason it couldn't have been, except that we're not taught that. And I agree with you that pornography just perpetuates that friction image and, and that, you know, you have to look this exact way or you're not attractive, you're not sexual. <clears throat> um, let me read just one quote. I have several quotes from, from your different materials. Pleasure is the birthright of each and every one of us. I, I just love that simple statement. And can you expound on that? Well, when, when we're young, if you watch any two, three, four, or five-year-old, uh, they have no, they, pleasure is built in. It feels good to touch themselves. It feels good. And, and so they do it without shame. And <clears throat> pleasure is intrinsic to our birthright. Uh, orgasmic pleasure, that usually is, gets blocked because of early experiences that were um, frightening. So orgasmic energy is really big sexual energy. And some people block the orgasmic pleasure because they're afraid of how big the energy is. And I know, I, I've seen, I mean, I've worked so intimately with so many women and I watch them shut down. As soon as it gets too close, to feeling too good or too big, there's a fear. There's a fear of, well, now I'm, maybe I'm not a nice girl anymore, or a fear of letting go, letting go of fluids. Uh, just letting go of the wild woman can be very frightening for many women. And, um, and I really do think that it's women <coughs> who are in the ray of healing now to awaken their full potential. And it, it will become the men in the ray of awakening their full consciousness potential. But for the women right now, it's really awakening their full goddess, uh, divine, feminine, sensual, sexual uh, capacity and birthright. So that falls into the question about pleasure. Birthright is our pleasure. And we have to sometimes teach a partner how we have pleasure because we've learned it from our own bodies. Hopefully. We, if we got to spend time, we've got to spend time with our bodies. And that's why I do classes on self-pleasuring and how long it should take and how, how extensive that self-pleasuring date with yourself 
really needs to be on a regular basis, whether it's once a week or once a month. What can you give yourself that's just for you, where you learn about your body and what arouses you? And how can you extend your, if you are having clitoral orgasms, can you extend that? to a longer and deeper and bigger experience than just a quickie. And I teach techniques about breathing and touch because what no one taught us. Right. You know, we figured it out when we were young and that's what we keep doing. Absolutely. I, I, I love that suggestion to take time and, and to express that feminine power. Do you believe that I know you do, but would you talk a little bit about how the woman coming into her full sexual power is shifting the dynamic in our culture in terms of equality with men and women? Not, it's not just a sexual expansion, in other words. Can you talk about that? Well, I can talk about it from having lived it with a partner whose, who, whose focus was my pleasure. And the, and the expansion of my pleasure. Now, I had never had that with a, with a partner, and I had several marriages, and there was just always something I knew wasn't, we weren't gonna get anywhere here. It was never gonna expand. So I, 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 I chose a partner whose focus was on the pleasure of the woman, and I had never had that. And, um, I went beyond what I ever imagined was my capacity for pleasure. And I went beyond thinking it was about his pleasure. And I, and I was with the partner. So I had to learn and I had to be educated that I as a woman had far more sexual energy and capacity for pleasure than a man does. Because I always thought it was the men that had all the sexual energy and all the interest and all the powerful sexual drive and libido and that I was somehow lagging behind. And, and there's a number of reasons why I thought that, uh, which I could expand on like an early hysterectomy in my 20s and and no no babies and no ability to have babies which is a woman's sign that she's fertile and a woman so i had a, to struggle to become the woman that i am uh but so learning that my sexual energy and orgasmic potential was far superior to any man's that I could orgasm over and over and over and ejaculate over and over and over. Men, men don't have that extended kind of orgasmic capacity. And it kind of brought an equality into my sexuality with men because I was with a partner who really valued me getting to the utmost capacity of who I am as a sexual woman. And um, you know, I'm very, very grateful and always will be to Charles Muir for being that man in my life. And uh, often not wanting to be, him not wanting to be the one to ejaculate in a lovemaking session, but making sure I did over and over and over. Well, I didn't know what ejaculating was until I was taught and learned and had the experience with a man who said, yay for you. You can, and here's our stack of towels to absorb all the, all the moisture. And because uh, you know, women worry about the sheets and making a bed, <laughs> and all the things women have to think about changing the bed and all that stuff. But when you load, that's going to happen, and you're prepared for the releases of the fluids and the celebration of those releases, and your partner is so there. For, for, for you, or for me as a woman in my case, I, uh, I was able to just keep letting go and letting go. I wasn't worried that, oh, it's about your turn now, or what about you? And a lot of women have a, a limit to how much pleasure is okay for them. Like I've, I've had some, now it's your, now it's time for you. And so we go right back to giving again, because that's familiar to the man, because we've had 
enough. <laughs> we decide. I, I love what you're saying. I mean, it's kind of, it really is mind blowing. And there are so many elements that you've brought in. I want to go back to something that, uh, that came to my mind earlier and then come back to, to all the way through what you've just said. Uh, the first thought was about integrating the spiritual into the sexual and coming together and whether you meditate together or whatever whatever your sacred ritual is yeah you know that it establishes and i learned to do that with my husband like 12 years ago and it completely revolutionized our sex and my sexual ability to enjoy and that that was because it made me feel safe mm -hmm. yeah and I don't mean safe in the way of, you know, predictable and, you know, boring. I mean safe in the way that I'm in a container of sexuality and spirituality, that God is blessing my pleasure, so to speak. Do you, do you relate to it in that way, too? And is, is that your experience when, when you do integrate the spiritual into the sexual, that it allows people to feel safer and therefore more adventurous? Yes, absolutely. It's the, it's the deepest connection we can have with another human being. And it doesn't take a long ritual to create that safety with a partner. Right. Every partner Every a set of partners can create their own prayer, their own ritual, their own entry into the sacred sexual realm. Yes. And I agree about safety. Safety for women is way at the top. Yes. And I think that's why so many women come to work with me as a woman, not because they're female oriented in their sexuality, but because I'm safe. Yes. And... I love what you're saying that, you know, how Charles integrated that element of safety in that this is about your pleasure. You're safe with me. Yes. You know, I want you to receive. And that is, you mentioned it, that is so difficult for women in general. It's so difficult to just receive. Why is that? And, and how important is that? Well, you're the you're the one and you're the psychologist. I mean, why is that is a big question. Why can't we receive? We are such amazing beings, us women, and we give so much. We spend our whole life giving and we love giving. So why can't we receive equal to how we give? What is that psychological? How deep and old is that? Surely it's ancestral. Our mothers couldn't do it. Our grandmothers couldn't do it. So we can't do it either. Right. Well, if, if you want a one second explanation, I mean, I think it has to do with making ourselves indispensable to men so that they'll protect us and provide for us. You know, it goes all the way back to caveman days. You know, I, I truly believe it has to do with the domination of, of men over women and that you know we have learned these methods of securing ourselves and that's one of the primary ones that's very true very true and it's it's in in all of us we can't it's hard to shake that it, it'll come up even when you think it's gone absolutely yeah. absolutely and i love that your focus on shifting that dynamic in the sexual spiritual realm because once you do that, it will expand. Yeah, it will expand. I mean, either you stop doing anything sexually or intimately with your partner. You okay? You want to drink? Um, I, you know, I've had, I've had moments in this partnership that I'm in now for almost 20 years where he wants to sometimes just go unconscious and I, I'll just stop right in the middle of everything and go, no, I will continue. This is not true for me. Um, let's just rejoin a, a, on another time when the consciousness and the sacredness is present. And it, it was up to me because I might have been on my way to having some great pleasure or something, but I'll just go, no, I won't do this anymore because then you'll feel successful 
<laughs> and it'll reinforce that dynamic. It reinforces the dynamic because I am a giver and I love to serve and take care of and, but I have to be careful. I don't overdo that. Uh, I love that. And I love the, the, the tool that you just brought up. Really. It's a tool is that you can stop any time things don't feel right. Mm -hmm. And that, would you agree that that's a very universal yeah, what's well, liberating me, it's liberating me into my no. No, I won't do this right now. No, you can get up and get it for yourself. Or no, I won't continue this way right now because it feels empty. I'm not feeling anything. And I want to participate intimately and in every way with you, my chosen beloved for this 20 year period of my life and beyond. I want it to have meaning, heart and meaning. And um, so I'm here to say we're not having heart and meaning right now. And I just love that permission, though. And I've had to teach that to clients forever is, you know, you can stop. <laughs> and this goes back to what you were saying before about the, the rush to orgasm. You know, it's like, God forbid you would stop the man from getting to his orgasm and say that doesn't feel good or whatever it is, or I don't feel connected. But I, I love what you're saying that, yes, you can stop. Yes, you can. And it's a, a, a moment of the biggest step of empowerment for women when they are holding a man's wand or it's inside of them and they open their eyes and they put their hand on his chest and they say, open your eyes and be present with me if you want to continue. And then, whoa, often they say, I will now I can't continue. Okay. If, the, if it's real, it'll come back again. But we have to come into our empowerment, Helen. And that's the work I'm doing with Amrita now in the Sacred Feminine Mystery School is woman by woman by woman going through these practices to help them really step in to this place of empowerment where they do have the power within to say no not now not that way uh, let me lead i'll tell you when i'm ready you things know, like that. one of my favorite things <clears throat> is you cannot say yes until you can say no no and that's exactly what you're talking about is that until a woman can say no, not like that, or no, not now, or whatever it is, she can never feel that safety to surrender, True. you know, to that, to that energy and, and have real ecstasy. So I, I love what you're saying. Let me quote another excerpt from your wonderful work. Th this is about yourself. I practice living in tantric union with myself and the life around me weaving an expanded awareness in the practical necessities of life. Mm. Mm. I did say that. <laughs> I love that when you, know, you say something so profound. Oh, did I say that? Yeah, I did say that. Did so say what that. does that mean to you that you live in tantric union with yourself and the life around you? So tantric union, just to draw uh, the listener a picture, is a circular union. It, it's oval. If, if you will. It's not direct, it's not linear. Uh, like, like sex, penis and vagina sex is linear, right? The tantric union is circular. So he comes into me, I raise that energy up to my heart, I send my heart to him. That would be the circular exchange of energy in tantric union. So I do that with myself. Uh, I touch myself many times a day when I go to the bathroom. Uh, women have to pee a lot. <laughs> and I take a moment to connect with my sacred yoni, my sacred space. And I bring that energy up with a breath. And I bring it into my face and my eyes. And when I go out the door with my purse on my arm and I'm off to this market, I've got a smile on my face. And I've had people come up to me saying, are you expecting someone or are you, uh, you just look so happy <laughs> for no reason. But I know I do have a reason because I'm really running this sexual, spiritual energy within myself. 
I'm not touching myself. My hands aren't inside my panties. I'm just, <laughs> my purse is over my arm and I'm, I'm having a spiritual sexual union with God, goddess, as I go off to the market. Right. And that's how I got off of antidepressants, <laughs> antidepressants when I was in my 50s and going through the menopausal years. I finally just said, I'm done with all of the artificial anything. I am, I have the capacity to run this energy each and every day of my life until I leave my body. And whether I'm with a partner or being sexual with someone else or even with myself, I can run this energy through me of the heavenly divine energies, the sensual pleasure energy by simply knowing it's there. Do you, I, I love what you're saying and I, I so relate to it, you know, oh, that, really? that it's uh, one of my other uh, experts, Rebecca Benito, excuse me, Rebecca Benito, I don't know if you've heard of her, but she was talking about that sacred sexuality is with you and everything in life and how she felt herself feeling very sexually attracted to her friend's new stove. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Oh my God. I love that lamp. I feel sexually toward that lamp. Oh, I, mean, I love is, that lamp all day. Yeah. Right. yeah. Absolutely. And so I love what you're saying about bringing that life force energy through your body I'd like you to talk a little bit about uh, the. Is the, do you distinguish between chi, you know, life force energy, and sexual energy? It, do you distinguish between those? Is life force energy actual sexual energy? I don't know. I, I, I you know, shakti is the word from the tantric writings of the Hindu India uh, uh, the, the his the um, umbrella that I, of learning that I come from, which is the, the tantric umbrella. And Shakti is the life force energy of the universe. It's a great word, Shakti. I love it. Um, and it runs through every tree and every flower coming into bloom. And it's, it's always happening. So that Shakti energy runs through me and all the time. If I, if I act, and I sometimes have to activate that energy. Because sometimes I'm just feeling a little flat or my brain is worrying too much about what's happening in the world or what's happening financially or right. you know, all the stuff that can distract me from this life force energy. And I, I wouldn't call it always being certainly sexual, but it's aliveness. Maybe that's the translation I would give to it. It's my aliveness. And in my aliveness, I thank God every day and goddess for my aliveness. And I like the way you're saying that because it, we, we get to feel alive every day of our lives. And if we don't, if we don't have that feeling of aliveness, of vitality, of Shakti, as you're saying, we're not going to have great sacred sex. They translate with it to each other, don't they? Yeah. 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 And, and um, you know, if we're busy using our aliveness in the kitchen, let's say, because God, I take so much pride in the way I cook and the way I clean it and the way I put things away. And I really love my domain. But in the bedroom, I have to bring that same respect. And even if I'm not feeling aroused, it's, it, the arousal is the aliveness within me that I bring to the gift of having a partner who is willing to lay with me and hold me and play with me and talk to me. That's where the gratitude starts to make me feel my own arousal, which may be genital or may not be. If my heart's aroused, I'm home. <laughs> I love how you're saying that, Caroline. Uh, and. And it's like another, it reminds me of another saying that the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Oh, wow. wow. And you, that's what you're describing. You take great pride in the way you are in your kitchen and the relationship you have with your cooking and with the cleaning of it and the maintaining. And, and it's like, you know, you're making love with your kitchen. 
<laughs> yeah, and the, and my bed, and and exactly. And my partner will say to me frequently, "God, I love how you make the bed. No one ever made a bed in my life like you do. It's a joy to get into every night." <laughs> you know, that's so, and it's it, there. You have it. That's what you're doing. You know, you're you're you have a sacred relationship with how you make the bed, and I think this can't be overemphasized in terms of people wanting to have great sex. It it's like you know, you're, you're going to have, eight hours a night in, and the bed that we make love in is kept as a sacred temple for love and for rest. Um, that's a good reason to pay attention to how you put it together every day and how you pull the sheets up and how you get dressed if your body is a sacred temple of spirit then how you drape that body and how you present yourself it's it's all about the sacred and and unfortunately uh helen so much in our culture the sacred has been lost yes i uh, agree so i'm so so sad about that but it is being refound <laughs> yes it is <clears throat> that reminds me of another one of your quotes. I'm going to leave the, I'm going to paraphrase part of it, but it's about how much energy we put into work or art or other endeavors. And, and you're saying in the same way, men and women who are passionate about their relationship must be committed to manufacturing the energy needed to sustain it. Can you add to that? Well, it's a, it's a commitment to honoring and respecting that you have a partner who wants to continue to grow with you. And I, I want to address, I want to bring that into one of your earlier questions about the aging years and how, because I'm facing that now uh, in my mid, moving into my later 70s. I never thought I'd be this age. I never thought I'd be with a partner who's exactly the same age. Of course, how could I have, you never know. And I'm seeing both of us at times um, moving more slowly, moving more awkwardly, um, just needing more help to get from here to there or to, and sometimes I find my, my critic coming in and going, ooh, I don't like this. This is not, this is not working for me. <laughs> this is not working for me. <laughs> but the truth is, it's making me more come fully into my unconditional loving heart, which I've been devoted to for many, many years, that unconditional love. And more now than ever, I'm being asked to call upon the unconditional because the, the youthful qualities that attracted me to my partner even 10 years ago are not as present and apparent as they used to be. And I see how my mind wants to judge and criticize either me or him. So it's, it's just me, it's telling me, Caroline, go deeper into your unconditional loving heart because this is what aging, it's the gift of aging is to forgive each other for the fact that we've come this many years and we're still doing pretty well, uh, whether it's in the bedroom or in, you know, just watching a program together in the evening and holding hands and sitting close. Um, it's appreciating that we have a partnership and, and a good, sweet, dear, wonderful partnership. And, and in the bedroom, I want to uh, talk about that for a minute, too, because neither one of us have the agility that we had 10 years ago. And we often joke, well, who's going to be on top? And we go, well, I don't want to go. I can't be on top. My knees ache. And on my <laughs> hips. Exactly. I can't go <laughs> tonight. Well, they, how can they reach across if we're lay, both laying on our backs? What shall we do now? So it's, it's, it's making us laugh. And we find more humor in touching each other and pleasuring each other in ways that are comfortable. And, you know, it's so, I, I say all this because it needs to be said. I love that. 
You know, I love that. My, I'm almost 70. My husband's 72. And it's like sometimes, oh, my shoulder hurts, Sonny. You know, and it's like, okay, well, you know, sometimes we have to stop and sometimes he can't have an orgasm and sometimes I'm not feeling it. I mean, but it's like who, can, you know, we, we have that love and we have to practice that too. And I want to expand the, the, how people are relating to this because I don't care if you're 22 or you're 72, there are things, uh, you know, that you may be challenged with, you know, not everybody has a, a perfectly functioning body. And I, I just want to, you know, generalize what you're saying, to, you know, people with some sort of physical challenge, you can find a way, yeah. you know, whether the physical challenge is aging or whether it's some sort of other challenge, I don't care what it is. You can find a way to find that sacred sexuality. I'm sure you've come across that many times. Oh, my God. I think one of my, if I may for a moment, uh, my greatest teachers was a man who um, ran our business for us in, in Maui, uh, Charles and I, when we were starting the Tantra business. And um, Michael was this tall, handsome, beautiful Nebraskan guy, and he was just the best business manager. Well, one day, Michael dove into... Uh, a uh, shallow uh, surf in Maui and broke his neck on a sand dune uh, and um, diving for a frisbee and became uh, in a quadriplegic in a wheelchair for the next 23 years. And I was uh, uh, on the team of helpers uh, that would visit Michael every week and, and help him learn to live in a wheelchair. And he had been very devoted to our um, tantric Educate, educational system in our business. And uh, he didn't want to have to lose his ability to have a woman in his life or to be sexual. He said, how can I be sexual? I can't feel anything. I don't know how to make anything happen. Who wouldn't want to be with me? And so we just kept looking into each other's eyes. And I'd say, Michael, if you can look into my eyes, you can have all of me. And there are women just like me who would love to be with a man as present as you. And there are things, we're gonna find out what they are to make that erection happen. And she can climb up on in your wheelchair and get on top of you. And by golly, Helen, all that finally happened for him. Oh, that's so wonderful. Fabulously beautiful woman came into his life and said, I am here to love you and care for you for as long as I can. And then he would tell me, she did it. I got an erection and even though I couldn't feel it, I could see her enjoying herself on top of me. And he said, oh, Caroline, you were right. You know, thank you so much. I, I was losing hope. And so things like that, Helen, have really told me that, wow, as bad as it can be, it, it can be worked out. That makes, that brings tears to my eyes, honestly, you know, because I think the, the, the way I would summarize all of that is don't ever give up hope that you, that you can have what you dream of sexually. Don't give up hope. And, you know, all of your work is a fantastic way for people to explore what's possible. And I, I think that that's another reason that I wanted to do this series is I've met with so many people who have given up hope. Yes. And I know that your whole practice must have been full of those people. Oh, and it constantly is something I have to work with, with, uh, with people who come work with me privately. And I, I often use the analogy of Pandora's box. And Pandora had to keep pulling all this cobwebs and all this stuff out of her box. But what did she finally find at the bottom? When she finally reached the bottom of the box was hope. So keep pulling out the cobwebs, keep pulling out the demons in the shadows because somewhere in there is hope and hope is what keeps us going. So do you have something that you, a free gift that you want to promote? I, I, I don't even know if I asked you that before, <laughs> um, but do you have one that you generally offer? And Absolutely. And uh, um, Rita has to remind me because she's the one who's in charge of my business life. But it's the three part video series that's on my website, um, uh, Reclaiming Female Feminine Confidence. Uh, it's a very professionally done three-part little video series. I think each video is about 20 minutes. Uh, it's on my website. And um, 
which is a divine-feminine.com. And um, it's, I speak to women over 50, uh, mainly who have begun to lose hope or who have begun to think, well, I just, I'm a good grandmother, but I can't, and that's, this is my lot in life now is to just cook the, the turkey on Thanksgiving and be a good grandmother. And um, th those are the women that I feel I want to reach out and, and bring into my arms and say, no, wiggle with me. There's so much time to play and there's so much life force in you still. Yes, absolutely. I love that. So that link will be in, in the promotion for, for your interview. And I really encourage people to take advantage of that. And I bet you that, that it would be just as apropos for younger women as women over 50, because who doesn't need to improve your confidence and your, you know, confidence in your sexuality. So I, I love that. And is there any, what final things would you like to say to the audience, Caroline? How can, how can people reach you? And what final uh, bullet points would you like to leave people with? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there's probably so many. But um, I'm available to any email I receive at caroline at carolinemuir.com. Um, I'm online. I mean, I'm on the web. I answer every inquiry. Uh, I do discovery calls if someone requests that. I do private sessions here in Panama City, which is a vacation that a, someone has to give themselves for a couple of days to work with me privately here. And I think the mystery school that I've uh, that I co-founded with Amrita is really giving a lot of women the opportunity to do the deep work on their own feminine, the blocks that keep them from claiming all that they are from the ancestral uh, blocks to the um, relationship blocks, because both Amrita and I are in very successful relationships. And we've learned a lot, you know, we're not kids. And um, we share our wisdom and we share our love. And we have it outlined in a very um, professional way, the, uh, the, the trainings that we're offering. So I'm here to be offering me myself to the world for as long as I'm in my body. I love that. And you're doing a training with Amrita in the Netherlands, right? When is that? That's a week long in September of 2020. Uh, that's a week long for women. Uh, it be a wonderful vacation to Europe. Um, and we do these, um, the, the trainings to become certified to teach the work. It's a, a profession that a lot of women are seeking. So how can I make a difference in the world helping women? And this is the way, this is the work I've been doing for the last 35 years. And Amrita has, she understands my work more than I ever understood it. And she has put it in a professional teaching format that I sit in the classroom now and I go, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. So give that website again, please. Well, there's sacredfeminineschool.com and there's divine-feminine.com. That's my website. And Amrita's, I think she gave hers probably several times, amritagrace.com. And if you just look up Carol, Caroline Muir, you'll find all of the other stuff. Google me. <laughs> and your books are available on Amazon and, and anywhere people buy books. So That's right. Amazon, Kindle, you know, just download the book if you don't want to buy it. They're very good books. They, that uh, Tantra, the Art of Conscious Loving book has sold over well over 100,000 copies and it's been translated into 12 languages. I think now it's officially translated into nine that are available and the Spanish language edition is on Amazon as well. So it gives you people an understanding of what is Tantra really? It's not just about sex, it is a yoga. Right, so what final points would you like to leave everybody with? Um, you know, I, I mean, we could go over so many of them, the sacred ritual, the saying no when you need to, the fact that life force energy, a connection with everything is really what brings it into, into sacred sex. What, what am I missing? Uh, I'd like to just part with a little, a little exercise that if you're taking a deep breath, and you squeeze the muscles inside 
of your yoni uh, that they call the Kegel exercises. There's a little muscle in there. That is the muscle that it orgasms when you have an orgasm. So, but you can exercise that muscle and you can play with that muscle. And with your breath, it will remind a woman each and every hour of the day that she lives and has sexual energy and it's hers to draw on. It's like a resource. Just harness some of that energy and bring it up into your heart and into your brain and, and do that next piece of work and do that next interview, Helen, and do what you're here and meant to do, but use that resource of energy from deep within. And it'll shine out your eyes just like you're doing right now. I feel you. I <laughs> doing it while I'm following the exercise. Following. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, Caroline. It's been a great Enjoy. privilege and honor and pleasure to talk to you for this time. And I'm so grateful to you for the work that you've done in the, in the name of love all these years and will continue to do. So bless you and thank you so much. I am blessed. Thank you.